Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's lovely to be back this week hosting the third series of the Public Interest Technology PIT or PIT Colloquium. My name is Roba Abbas, and I'm a visiting professor at Arizona State University's School for the Future of Innovation in Society and a senior lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia. Together with the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective, Professor Katina Michael, we are bringing you another session in this series. Katina and I would like to, as always, acknowledge the logistical, marketing and other support provided by Melissa Wait, Anna Reid, and we would like to welcome and thank Natasha Routleff for joining us in support of today's session. The Public Interest Technology Colloquium is an opportunity to hear from our global community about the social, regulatory and ethical and other considerations relevant to the design, development and delivery of technology in the public interest. So the colloquium is underpinned by the PIT philosophy that is intended to draw people together from across disciplines and to address global challenges. Public interest technology at its core requires shared meaning, which is translational. It is to be inclusive rather than exclusive. It is also transdisciplinary while respecting the disciplines. Throughout the series, we'll be hearing from a range of speakers who will be sharing with us their experiences and expertise. Our guest for today, I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Lynn Nethkin, Alicia Demessa and Matt Rogers. Each of our speakers will be delivering a presentation shortly, followed by a Q&A session facilitated by Alicia and an opportunity for reflection. Uh, a note for our live attendees, please feel free to write your questions in the chat window or indicate that you wish to speak to ask a question at the completion of the respective talks. I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Lynn Nethkin. Lynn is a co-founder and director of Intelligent Systems at Haley, in a technology startup in Phoenix, Arizona, that seeks to disrupt the solar industry through BIPV solutions and a unique business model. She is also a systems engineer, an engineering PhD student, and National Science Foundation National Research Trainee Fellow for Citizen Centered Smart Cities and Smart Living at Arizona State University. Her research focus brings an interdisciplinary lens of expertise in personal cognitive computing, physiological sensing, and Internet of Things technologies within the context of smart cities. Today, Lynn will be presenting on the social impact mindset. So despite the demand for clean, clean energy solutions within the residential sector, solar remains unaffordable for far too many. At Lynn's company, Haley, I hope I've said that correctly, is on a mission to not only disrupt the solar industry, but also to shift the narrative surrounding social impact in the technology sector. Thank you, Lynn, for joining us today, and I'll hand over to you. So first, I just want to say thank you for the introduction, and I would really like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to partake in the colloquium. I am honored to be here, and I'm really excited to talk with you all a bit about our work at Halley and what we are doing to not only address the inaccessibility of renewable energy, specifically solar, but uh, also how we've integrated this concept of the social impact mindset. So just as a little introduction here, you can see our founding team. My colleagues are absolutely wonderful and brilliant individuals. Um, you know, again, just kind of a little, little recap about myself. I completed my undergraduate degree in robotics engineering from ASU's Polytechnic campus. Um, after that, I completed a master's in systems engineering, and I'm now in the second year of my PhD program in systems engineering at ASU. Um, I am also an NSF um, NRT PhD fellow for citizen-centered smart cities and smart living. And this pro program is really Really been fundamental um, because it's helping to train students uh, to take a more people-centered approach to the design and development of solutions for modern society. And of course, a large part of the NRT framework, of course, is focused on this concept of the social impact mindset, which I'll explain a bit about later um, and what that means for those who may not be familiar. It's actually incredibly simple, but I'll definitely um, provide a little bit of background on that. 
So just before I get into this, though, on a note, um, I'm not sure kind of what the audience's expectations were for this presentation today. Uh, given my academic background, that would ordinarily be what I would do. However, since I am, uh, this really is a discussion about social entrepreneurialism and how we're kind of changing access to renewable energy, um, I'm going to really frame this presentation a bit different today. So it's not going to be um, real academic focused. It'll be more a kind of the entrepreneurial mindset. So a little about Halley, our official mission is to reduce carbon-based energy consumption by up to 70% in every home where Halley is installed. And that's great, right? It's something measurable that we can hold ourselves accountable to. But that in itself, in and of itself, doesn't make solar more affordable, uh, nor does it make it more accessible. So while we have a very clear goal to reduce carbon-based energy consumption, uh, what we're really trying to do is increase accessibility. And that requires so much more than offering yet a, another solar product uh, on the market that's, that follows the standard model of how solar is traditionally dis, uh, distributed and sold. So we've really had to rethink how solar is approached specifically here in the US because that's the, mar the market that we're initially focusing on. And yes, of course, part of that has required us to take a look at the technology. So with that said, um, at Halley, we will soon be launching our BIPV solar product. And for those who are not familiar, that stands for Building Integrated Photovoltaics. And essentially, these are solar panels that are fully integrated into the surrounding structure of the building. So I've provided a couple of uh, renders here of our product. Um, so you can see in these images where our panels are designed to integrate seamlessly with the surrounding roofing tiles, the surrounding roofing structure, uh, specifically the tiles that are kind of more common that we see here in the southwest U.S. and even other regions throughout the U.S. Uh, though I will say that uh, we are starting with these types of roofing materials, but our product will continue to evolve to where we can integrate some additional roofing, roofing materials. Now, with that said, BIPV in and of itself is actually not a new concept. It's been around for several decades. Now, there were some technical challenges that needed to be addressed. Um, particularly, there's one that's coined as the heat issue. So just to kind of provide a little bit of a visual for that with traditional rack mounted solar, which is what you see on this lower image here, you can see that there is a very clear path for air to flow underneath the solar panels. But with BIPV, because it is integrated into the surrounding structure of the building, it's obviously a bit more difficult to achieve that proper airflow that is necessary for optimizing the efficiency of the system and keeping the electronics, say, for example, uh, the microinverter, keeping those within safe operating temperatures. And those, see, these were some challenges over the years that uh, needed to be worked through. And fortunately, uh, we've been able to address these issues among others with our solution. So that's wonderful. We have a product, but that still leaves us with the question of how do we get this to people so that they can actually afford it? Um, and what are the other issues that are keeping people from adopting solar? So what we've learned um, as we've you know, talked with a lot of um, consumers, a lot of homeowners, um, a lot of people that are interested in the space and even not interested in this space. Uh, what we've learned kind of astoundingly is that the vast majority of the cost of solar um, is actually due to the door to door distribution modality that is used for the sales of solar. So we know that about 85% of solar is sold door to door. And of that, uh, of the cost of solar, 70% of that is paid out in sales, commission, marketing, distribution. Um, 
And so, for example, uh, you know, there's various points of distribution with various vendors along the way as you go from the manufacturing process to ultimately having it installed um, on a customer's home. At each point along the way, you have vendors who are tacking on these different profit margins. And then, of course, you have all the marketing and the sales and such that is necessary um, to reach customers at the end. And uh, hopefully they could, they purchase a system. Well, I mean, 70%, that is a massive overhead cost. And this is also because this cost gets passed on to consumers. Uh, this ends up being a major inhibit inhibitor for a lot of people as to why they don't adopt solar. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but essentially, uh, you know, the ROI period for traditional solar is, uh, you know, can be upwards of over a decade. Another thing that we learned is that the top three demographics for solar today are actually individuals who are in low income brackets, lower levels of education and on fixed incomes, which was really interesting because when we explored this more, what we eventually realized is that uh, the top three demographics that are adopting solar are also the ones who are unfortunately most vulnerable to high pressure sales tactics. So we want to really change the game for how solar is distributed, which I'll talk more about that. But there's some additional issues with solar as well. Um, you know, even kind of relatively minor things, if you will, as far as the aesthetics. Um, you know, there's a lot of hardware that's involved and so much so that even HOAs will not allow um, some developments to install solar on the front of homes to where it's or to where it's visible, um, which is another inhibitor. Um, you also have the potential with solar where it can actually avoid roofing warranties because of how the hardware is installed on top of the roof. It can sacrifice the integrity of the roofing system and therefore it can void warranties. Um, so that's another potential challenge with this. And then in addition to that, unfortunately, we're seeing less and less incentives for consumers to adopt solar. Um, and you know, we've heard a lot about, or perhaps you've heard a lot about net metering. It's essentially programs that uh, utility comp companies had implemented where you can uh, basically uh, sell solar, sell your so excess solar uh, back to the grid, and then you can receive credits credits for that. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing less and less of those. Uh, those, just, those plans are starting to be phased out. And so there's a lot less incentive now for consumers to adopt solar. On top of that, it's um, the general affordability of solar with um, you know, the different systems that are out there. One example is Tesla. They also have a building integrated system, which is absolutely beautiful. Unfortunately, it is uh, exceptionally unaffordable for the vast majority of people. Uh, I'd like to give this as an example. Our COO, Dan, um, he, out of curiosity, went on the website, filled out the form to uh, get a quote to see what it would be to put a system on his house. And before tax incentives, his quote came in at $180,000 for a Tesla system. So that may be feasible for a, a percentage of people, but for the vast majority, it's just not affordable. So with that said, what we are looking to do uh, sorry, let me go back here. Uh, what we're looking to do is really address like how do we reduce the cost of solar so that we can get this in the hands of more people and by that have a positive impact on the environment, right? Because there's not only the address to or the opportunity to address uh, some of the concerns that people have with solar, which I talked about, but specifically really reducing that cost. We've got a, a you know, talking about an opportunity to potentially reduce costs by up to 70%. And this is where the real disruption lies. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for everyone, but it is not uncommon for engineers and designers to uh, kind of adopt a very technologically focused lens to where we tend to think that if we just introduce the technology, that that's going to be what it takes to solve the problem, right? And so, yes, like in our case, we've had to address the heat challenge and some other issues with BIPV, and that's great, but that's not ultimately what's going to disrupt the industry. 
industry uh, will be able to uh, disrupt the solar industry because we're going to be changing the business model uh, for how solar uh, is distributed and how it ends up reaching the end consumer. So that's where we decided to really change the game. And we're going direct to home builders. So it's simple, right? We're just kind of shifting that whole business model. In other words, instead of sending out a team of salespeople to go door to door to homeowners, uh, we're gonna be distributing our products such that it is standard on new homes with our building partner network that continues to grow, which is really exciting. We already have uh, partners lined up for, uh, I think six states uh, across the, the US now, which is really exciting. You know, and this not only, helps save home builders on the overhead costs um, since we're replacing part of the roofing materials that they would normally absorb uh, we're replacing that with our system but it also cuts out that in those entire middle processes that would ordinarily tack on those profits along the way uh, you know those uh, profit margins along the way that you would traditionally observe with uh, your traditional solar models so just to kind of, uh, you know, this is a slide that we kind of normally show to our investors and stuff, but I think it's good because it really kind of gives a, an idea of uh, how much so far we've been able to significantly reduce the cost of solar while remaining competitive in terms of efficiency. Um, which is really great. So this and this comparison here is on a standard eight eight and a half kilowatt system, um, but you can see here our system is coming in at around twenty three thousand. Where you compare that to something like Tesla's BIPV product, where you're coming in around ninety three ninety four thousand, and as I mentioned, potentially way way more than that as well. And then when you look at kind of some of the more um, you know, traditional solar systems, not necessarily Certainty and Suntegra, those are some additional BIPV solutions, but even those are coming in around that 50K and upward mark. So unfortunately, what this results in though, is that, uh, you know, traditionally uh, customers would see a 10 to 15 year plus return on investment period, which is an exceptionally long time. And that unfortunately typically becomes the breaking point for consumers where they're just like, you know what, that's just way too long for us to really see the benefit in, in investing in this. Where with Halley's model, and because of how the ITC tax credits work, which are essentially just um, tax credits that you can get from the federal government for installing solar on your home, um, we our customers will be able to start seeing um, a positive ROA, ROI within one to two years, which is absolutely phenomenal. And part of that is not only because you get a credit for installing solar, but because it's BIPV, you also get a credit uh, for the actual roof itself, which is a big overhead expense, right? When you're building a new home. So that's really, really exciting. You know, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a done turnkey solution uh, where solar can become the standard for new homes. You know, it's such a small change and yet it has the opportunity for this massive impact. But with that said, we're not stopping there. Our longer term goals are to also release an intelligent control system that optimizes energy consumption uh, within the home. And that's, of course, in conjunction with our BIPV solar solutions for energy production. Uh, beyond that, we're also looking at launching an energy trading marketplace for our customers. You know, again, we've kind of seen a lot of the elimination of those net metering programs. We think that introducing something like an energy trading marketplace for our customers would be really something exciting and encourage individuals to um, not only adopt solar, but to try and conserve as much energy as possible because there's opportunity them to um, gain financial incentive for uh, conserving as much energy as possible, which is really exciting. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of complexity that's involved with uh, implementing something like an energy trading marketplace. So we still have a lot of planning to do as far as that goes. That's kind of why it's one of our more long-term goals, but that is something that's on our roadmap as well. Now, as I mentioned, um, you know, at Halley, we've adopted what is known as the social impact mindset, and it influences 
nearly everything that we do as a company because for us being an entrepreneur is about so much more and it's so much deeper than the simple applications of the technology or even the economic benefits right um, if we look at the broader scale you know economic benefits with perhaps some environmental factors is typical is typically like where the corporate narrative would end uh end in this space you know though perhaps you may see some that have like a a nonprofit arm where they're involved in different social causes that, that they're particularly interested in, which is fine. You know, that's certainly one model. Uh, but at Halley, we're looking to really create a shift. Um, so we didn't stop at social impact in terms of, hey, we're offering a solar product. This is going to have a a uh, positive impact on the environment because it's going to help reduce uh, reliance on carbon energy. You know, we didn't limit it to, hey, you know, we're going to be creating jobs. It's going to contribute to the GDP and have this economic impact. Um, for us, the social impact mindset is something that permeates the entire philosophy of our work and what we do it influences our design decisions our business model our company culture and so much more so i've been talking about you know kind of the social impact mindset and you know well what what is this what is social impact and you know when we were first looking into this uh you know we saw stan uh, stanford defines social impact as how organizations and people's actions affect the surrounding community well when we read this immediately uh for us we were like well wait we have we have a problem we have a challenge with this definition um and it's because it's specifically focused on this surrounding community impact and so for you know at Halley, we're like well we're going to be installing on homes nationwide you know there's not a necessarily a, a geographical boundary for us that says that we're limited to phoenix arizona right so does that mean that we're not making a, a social impact well of course not right so for us at Halley, social impact and the mindset that we have adopted um, is how organizations and people's actions create change and the really important thing about this is that we do not place limits on what that means it can be social impact in terms of the environment it can be social impact in terms of the economy it can be social impact in terms of governance it can be social impact in terms of so many different elements so as i mentioned earlier the social impact mindset kind of permeates our culture at Halley and, and really influences what we do. So for example, traditional corporate models, like I mentioned, they might say like, oh, we're launching this solar product, you know, it's uh, gonna offset carbon-based energy consumption, it's gonna help with the environment. And then that might be kind of where it stops. But on the back end, their product is designed at the exclusion of the circular economy, at the exclusion of data privacy rights, at the exclusion of underserved communities, at the exclusion of fair and unbiased algorithms, right? The list can go on and on. And this is what we very typically see in kind of more traditional models, whether within you know the solar industry or not. So for us, it's about adopting this mindset to not limit ourselves in terms of what we can do as a company and as individuals. So kind of to bring it all together, like the, the social impact mindset is really about having this conscious awareness of our ability to create change through our actions and again there's there's no limit to this so when we're thinking about this at at Halley, for example um you know and how much it influences our decisions along the way right when we look at energy production we're developing a you know bipv solar product we don't just say okay we're going to develop the system we're going to put it out there and that's it right we think about well what recycled plastics can we integrate into the frame structure so that we can help reduce waste? What about this circular economy? You know, for example, when we're going to be 
installing on homes starting this year, we have a 25 year warranty on our products. Well, that means 25 years from now, we're gonna have masses of systems that are gonna need to be replaced. What happens with all of that material? What happens with the glass? What happens with the cells, the plastics, the batteries, the electronics? There's so many different components to this, you know, and we don't want it to just end up in a landfill. We wanna really take in this idea of the circular economy. And unfortunately, there's not easy answers to these questions yet, but the point is, is that we're thinking about these things and figuring out how we can address them now um, you know, as best we can, and then doing what we can as a company to help push these different concepts along. So whether it's the circular economy, uh, whether it's integrating, you know, recycled materials, whatever the case may be, you know, same as moving forward when we look at implementing our, what we call our AIoT technology. This is gonna be a system that will collect environmental data um, to optimize energy consumption throughout the home, right? You know, we've become very accustomed to having, uh, you know, sensors everywhere, we're listened to, we're watched, all of these different things, where we take a very different approach to this. We believe in a very strong data policy. So uh, we want to ensure that, you know, our data is never going to be shared and sold. We're going to be kind of the antithesis of, uh, say, the Googles of the world, for example. Um, and you know we we've, we've had plenty of investors even ask you know like hey how come you guys don't have you know data the selling of data is part of your business model and we just refuse to do it we believe in people's right to data privacy um, you know, when we're developing our artificial intelligence algorithms, it's important that we're taking into consideration uh, bias that can be introduced into the system when developing algorithms and such. Um, you know, it even comes down to looking at, uh, you know, we're onboarding new individuals to our team. We want to make sure that they have a conscious awareness of not only what they can do and contribute, um, but what um what potential impact they can have whether positive or negative right we want people to be very conscious and aware of those things you know if i'm hiring an ai developer but they're not conscious about the potential bias that they may implement into a system then that's actually not a good hire for heli because that can have potentially a negative social um impact on it on our customers and on individuals so again for us it's just kind of this very um uh, it's permeated our culture. It's a big part of who we are and all of almost nearly all of our decisions are focused on the social impact mindset and being aware of every opportunity we have as an organization to create that positive social impact on many, many different aspects, um, as opposed to kind of taking that narrower view. Um, so yeah, that is, I think, it. Yes, that'll do it. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing with us your company's mission. And, um, I have many thoughts, comments and questions, particularly around disruption of the solar industry and the technology sector, but I think I'll hold off till question time. Uh, for now, I'd like to introduce our second speaker in today's session, Alicia De Mesa. Uh, Alicia is currently a doctoral student engaged in community-based participatory research and Indigenous research methods to explore emerging technologies for traditional ecological knowledge storytelling by and for Indigenous communities in the Southwest borderlands. Um, Alicia is also uh, our moderator for today's session, but we'll now hear from Alicia presenting on uh, enhancing inclusive knowledge and participatory design approaches, looking at questions questions such as for whom is technology developed and from whose, perspective, from whose perspective and what are the limitations of responsible innovation from the perspective of community harm. Uh, Alicia will consider dispelling the myth of neutral technology team positionality and discuss considerations for working with Indigenous communities. Over to you Alicia and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much and for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's good to see some familiar names in terms of people who are, are here 
and hello to all of you. What I'm going to do is actually take you through uh, a little bit of a journey in terms of who I am as a scholar, which will help inform some of some of the things that I'm talking about here. The very first thing I want to say is that this is like many things living and in process. And so if you're hoping to take away concrete uh, answers, you may or may not get that. And this is, I'm positioning this presentation as more of discussion points and to actually raise, I, I hope at the very least, some awareness in terms of what, what is technology development and especially in context to communities, indigenous communities and potential harm with that. So I'm gonna just start off with saying that um, I am, so I'll, I'll greet you in, in a, a traditional way of Dagote Ashi Alicia de Mesa, I'm a very proud uh, Apache descendant of Chihuahua, Mexico. I'm mixed race. And so my family is Japanese from Fukuoka Island, Mestiza from Aguascalientes, Mexico, and Apache from Chihuahua, Mexico. I wear actually many hats at ASU. And so I'm speaking to you from my doctoral hat. And one of the things, and we'll go to the next slide, is that, you know, as an as an older woman, I grew up in the, the, the 70s, the 80s, you know, by the 90s, I was an adult. And in the 90s, I was working in technology in the Bay Area. And so a lot of what I was seeing within um, technology, both as a kid, as a teen, and then as a working adult, before we have uh, the world that we have today in terms of technology and that permeating our culture in incredibly disruptive ways, some very positive, some not so very positive. You know, the, 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 the sci-fi imaginaries of what the futures look like. I happen to have been in, in the brand world working in, with brands such as AT&T who had images that were very similar to this screenshot that I have here that I really wish I could remember the original ad for. But this is an ad, it's a more recent ad, and it reminds me very much of those original AT&T, what are the future, the future is type of um, advertisements that were trying to plant a seed of how our cultures, our, our imaginaries could be, and how technology was going to take us there, very specifically how corporations were going to take us there. And so when I look at this kind of a, a image today, which again is actually a recent image, it's not from the 90s, I'm looking at it thinking this is not the, the, the future that applies to me, to my people, or to anybody like me, especially within Indigenous communities. So. I will, I will plant that seed there. Um, and I'll go to the next slide. So when you think about that in terms of who we are as an individual and how that relates to our families, our cultural identities, our educational identities, there's so many, you know, insert identity here that when you really stop and think that technology more often than not is uh, created from the perspective of, I'm sorry, people in the room. Right. And it's not just this isn't a conversation just about the people in the room. This is a larger conversation and a larger narrative of corporate responsibility to actually look at for whom is tech developed and from whose perspective in the room, but very clearly outside of the room. Because technology today, as we all know, and especially within this context of public interest technology, is altering the very faces of how we exist as human beings. It's altering the very faces of how communities are. And there's that word community. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And, you know, community is something really, it, it started to hit me about maybe like three years ago. And, and in the introduction, you heard that I'm working with community-based participatory research methods, which are approaches to trying to neutralize the playing, the power differentials, the playing fields, uh, rather than having, you know, the, the corporate so and so or the academic so and so or the government researcher so and so as at the, the top of the power table, CBPR is, is a, an attempt to try to neutralize that where knowledge is actually comes from many places oftentimes from people who don't necessarily have the credentials, oftentimes from people who do not think in the same way, do not hold the same viewpoints. Now we're talking world viewpoints, values, ethics, how, how we approach the world, how we think about the world. And to use the academic jargon, axiology. It's the axiology of uh, how, how we exist in the world itself. And so um, a few years ago, I started hearing community a lot and pop up a lot. And, I, and, and it was always within the context of 
development, whether that was sustainability development, technology development, um, perhaps even uh, academic expansion development. There was a, this community was inserted in as a word that suddenly meant something, maybe kind of like a buzzword, maybe altruistically, yes, we're really trying to think beyond our the ivory towers or beyond the corporation. But, but community is a, a, a slippery word because we all seem to think that we know what that means. And yet I question, do we really know what that means? And what are the differences between public community groups of people? And so on the next slide, I started to go through some of the, the different scholars. And this is again, a work in progress, but I was starting to get curious of, you know, how is actually community defined? And so I was looking into social um, science scholars who probably have studied this most and, and have really talked about this the most in terms of what does that actually mean? And, and, you, and I've put out a few different uh, scholars here in terms of going through different ideas of what this is, what it means, and how they build upon each other as well. And what it what's interesting is that by the time we get into um, some of the quotes here from McQueen et al, that were about, you know, this, what is the definition of it, of being a larger a community the meaning from from not just place but relationships of collective political power of behavioral and attitude oriented fibers and tissues um all these things that connect and potentially link people but here's the thing you know we have this intersectionality a lot of times and chavis lee was talking about this in terms of this who we belong to how we belong in community can be multifold i can actually belong to many communities and um Yet, when I put that back into juxtaposition of some of those those conversations I hear in multiple realms about community, there's this myth of its unity, it's homogenous. There's a nostalgia even to it in terms of the word, and and it's kind of an interesting thing how how it's kind of a, an emotional play for we must all be one. But here's the truth: we're not, and that's the absolute truth. So. When you think about that, and I'm going to go to the next slide about bias, bias is something that is really interesting for, um, we obviously all have it. And how much do we have it? Well, I'll, I'm going to show you. So on this next slide here, we have an actual, this is um, an incredibly, if you can't make out a word of that, then that's by design. Okay. This is actually a map that is a cognitive bias codex. And this was a, a few researchers attempt to pull together all of these different realms of what bias is and how it affects us as human beings. But uh, on the next slide, if you look at a certain part of this, and I have to actually bump this up for myself as well, what's really interesting is that part of the, a good quarter of that codex is talking about not enough meaning. And I, now I want you to take this into what does that mean, not enough meaning? And you can kind of read some of the questions here in terms of we imagine things and people we're familiar with or fond of as better. We fill in characteristics from stereotypes, generalities, and prior histories. Now, let me tell you something. That one right there, having been a person who worked in marketing for a long time, I can't tell you, I don't know actually of a single marketing uh, department in corporate America in particular, who doesn't work with that one right there. We simplify probabilities and numbers to make them easier to think about. We think we know what other people are thinking. We project our current mindset and assumptions onto the past and future. And I would add to that, we project our current mindset and assumptions onto people, past, present, future. This is inherently within every single human being on this planet, no matter who you are. And what's the problem with that? So if we go to the, the harm slide, you know, a lot of times, actually what's been kind of interesting to me is that thinking about this within um, indigenous communities in particular, there's, there is a myth that Native America or indigenous peoples of Australia, New Zealand, other places around the world, there's some kind of a homogeneity, homogeneity there because we have some kind of a label that goes on to that. I don't know if you know this, but there are over 500 federally recognized tribes in the United States alone. Every single one of them has different languages, cultures, prayers, experiences. It's incredible how rich this is. And, and yet the, 
Native America, Native American, um, you know, insert your word here of how someone is, is these groups of people are, are described. And the histories that are associated with, with all of these groups around the world are always associated with harm. Bottom line, settler harm, colonial harm, political harm, genocide, land grabs. And that harm, you say, most people think is in the past. But when we look at, there are many, 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 many indigenous scholars who will talk about what are the current? How does that parlay to today? How does it parlay to the future? So when I'm looking at harm, there is um, oftentimes an altruism in terms of development that's trying to think, well, I have, a, I have a good intent in going into a certain community, therefore it can't possibly create harm. And okay, so, but what does that mean? You know, what do I mean by harm? I'm not, right now I'm not talking about um, people being killed. I'm not talking about people being rounded up. Um, I'm not talking about really oppressive histories that have actually occurred. What I'm talking about in the present tense is lack of consent, it's misrepresentation, it's exploitation, it's unethical treatments of not just people, but place, nature, and data. And the more you understand and the more you learn about indigenous viewpoints and indigenous values, you'll know that all of those things go like this. They're not separate, they're all interlinked and holistically related. And so some of the examples of, of harm that have, have been really well noted out there um, actually, back in the 70s, there was the Barrow alcohol study that was conducted by Tulane University, and they did a, a major study, a major report, a major conference. It actually got reported by the New York Times, and the New York Times started to stigmatize a particular um, Alaska Native tribe as saying that they were a generation of despair likely to be extinguished. These went through all the headlines. And what actually happened as a result of that, this, I mean, talk about, you know, disparaging to um, this group and, and the harm that it caused to this particular uh, Native tribe, but it also actually caused their municipal bond rating as a governmental entity to drop from an A to, to a C plus because of the study, because of this coverage. And it was incredibly difficult to actually access funding when they needed it the most. Now you say, well, that's back in the 70s. Well, then we have um, a very famous case that does involve our own university with the Havasupai tribe in the 2000s. And, and you know, unfortunately, this is, this is a, a case that has made um, the textbooks in terms of why we even have more stringent uh, IRB and tribal IRB processes. But the long story short on this one, if you're not familiar with it, is that uh, we had a lawsuit against the ASU for researchers who were discovering um, DNA samples that were connected for a certain type of study used for other studies. And this was all without the, the consent, the storage of, of the data, the um, taking of, of the blood was all without consent. Now, I'm not going to even go into why that's so harmful, so hurtful to a group of people who, again, this is not an object over here. This is part of them that was robbed, taken away, exploited. There are a couple other uh, scholars, Virginia Eubanks, Ruha Benjamin, uh, who are have been prolific in terms of taking this also out to African-American communities, um, also other communities of color oftentimes on the, the very low end of, of the socioeconomic and what are the harms in this case of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And um, if I have any takeaways for this one, I would just tell you, please read their books. And there's a really great um, coded bias documentary that kind of summarizes their work. We think that we're creating technology. We think that we're pursuing science. We think that we're pursuing research for altruistic means. We can't possibly mean harm. But yet the cases, and these are just a few, and in and, and the, the reports of the case studies for you, um, Virginia Eubanks and Ruha Benjamin, there are many under them, are, are enormous. We could sit here for days actually going through all of the studies. And, and I'll go to the next slide. So when it comes to technology itself, and especially if you've looked at all at um, science and technology studies, you know, you say, well, don't we have some kind of frameworks and, and some kind of thought processes around 
how do we mitigate that? How do we bring in responsibility? How do we become more anticipatory, more reflexive, more inclusive, and more responsive? And um, what you don't see on the slide is um, von Schomburg, who you know originally defined responsible research and innovation as a transparent interactive process by which societal actors and innovators become mutually responsible, or I'm sorry, mutually responsive to each other with a view to the ethical acceptability, sustainability, and societal desirability in the innovation process and its marketable products. Okay, so that sounds really great. And I would say in theory, I don't know about all of you, but I would say, ooh, yay. But here's here's where I, I, I take some, I'm gonna point out the gaps of this. Is that again, going back to the original question of for whom is tech developed? through whose gates, through whose perspective. If I, and when you think about that room of, of the folks who are involved in any given you know, technology, who is there and how is that applying to people who have no idea that, for example, the Havasupai tribe actually has a completely different relationship with some of the things that Western really researchers take for granted. How do I know when I cross that line of harm? And the answer to all of this is that the responsibility is on us. The responsibility is on the researchers, the, techno, the uh, technological developers, et cetera. One of the things that I, I often um, criticize when it, when it comes to you know, the four dimensions of responsible innovation is something that's been pretty widely accepted uh, you know, by everybody who's looking at RI and RRI. These frameworks are in use in the EU, the, the European Union. Um, they're in use by a fair amount of corporations. Um, they're in use in academia. And then when I look at that reflexivity part, it seems like you know being re mutually responsive and then reflexivity. If I don't know what I don't know, and I'm only coming from the perspectives of the people in the room, and the perspectives of the people in the room does not include the, the 8 billion people on this planet. I know it's under that, but we're getting there, right? how in the world can we be reflexive or does that just become an echo chamber right i think i'm being reflexive because i'm talking about this and now we're going back to those bias notes there about how do i actually know when i don't have enough meaning when i don't have enough context and this is the reason why participatory inclusive knowledge is incredibly important when it comes to really truly looking at what is intended here with anticipation, reflexivity, inclusion, and, and responsiveness. One of the things I want to dispel is um, the myth of neutral positionality. And, and so um, if we go to the next two slides, you know, there's definitely within technology, there's this myth that position is neutral. And, um, you know, even in, in research, I, I love Diane Wolf's work, who's a feminist theorist, you know, who really slices this apart and says that you know, nobody is, you've got to look at the power dynamics here. And what is one's position? Are you somebody who's a complete outsider? If I'm working with a, a community and I'm not a part of that community, then I'm an outsider. Even if I'm a part of the community, and I'll give you a really quick example of this, of working with um, a particular uh, Latinx mostly, community in my hometown where my family has been for almost 100 years. I'm one mile away. Am I an insider or am I an outsider? Well, I'm actually kind of an insider outsider because I don't I don't live in that community, even though it's a mile away. I don't speak fluent Spanish. My identity is actually more indigenous than it is Chicana. There's lots of, of fluence, uh, fluencies and nuances here in terms of who am I and if I'm gonna lead a team to go work with that community, what does that mean? Where, where do I fall? And so knowing that is very, very um, critical and powerful for how we're working with communities. So when, um, and I'll go to the number, the, the next one, you know, when we're looking at considerations for working with indigenous communities, it, again, there are approximately, not approximately, there are 567 federally recognized American tribes in Alaska native villages. There are 400 non, federally recognized tribes. Do the math, 967 different languages, cultures, experiences, traditions, histories, and futures. That's just here 
in the United States. That's not taking into, into account First Nations in Canada, our pueblos in, in Mexico, or any other country around the world who has indigenous people. The sheer number of sovereign communities in the context of the United States and also in, in um, Canada, particularly, you know, that have that highly diverse cultures, languages, but really more importantly, governments, economies, decision making structures, it, it creates an imperative for technologists to develop services, products, infrastructures that are meant for quote society for community for you know insert your word here to recognize and to responsibly act on the heterogeneous nature of indigenous communities so this whole myth that native americans are it's like some kind of homogenous i don't know if you've seen any of the, the even the the inside jokes in indian country about being labeled as something else on on cnn you know or something else on the census we're not well well, maybe we are something else, but we're not something else, right? We are these distinct identities and distinct sovereign nations. Um, on the next slide, once there are in the in the realm of indigenous scholarship, there is so much good stuff. There, there is so much good looking from um, the, the lens of indigenous theory and thinking about things from our perspectives in terms of, again, not homogenous, but there are some commonality and intersectionalities between all these different indigenous cultures that intersect into something that can be talked about um, from kind of a broader level, even despite the, the different identities. Now, let me say this with every single tribe there is, recognized or not recognized has their own um everything in terms of viewpoints and decision making and and past presents and futures and so when we look at indigenous research itself you know there's there uh were these concepts that were finally articulated in the early 2000s and kirkness and bonhart were kind of the the two scholars who put this out first when we're looking at the four R's of working with indigenous peoples, we must come from a place of respect, of relevance, of reciprocity, of responsibility. And it's just through some of those basic, basic, basic concepts that it becomes um, critical for us when we're starting to think about mitigating harm to both individuals, to groups, and to uh, overall communities. On the next slide, the agency of voice of communities is incredibly important. So one of the things to realize is that when we're looking at this now, this doesn't matter if it is is technological development by a corporation. It does not matter if it is a university. It does not matter if it's the government. It matters that when we're looking at especially um, tribal communities, those communities speak for themselves. I, as a descendant, Apache descendant from Chihuahua, Mexico, have absolutely no say over the tribes here and cannot speak for in any way, shape or form San Carlos Apache or White Mountain Apache because they are their own sovereign nations. And so when we're looking at this in terms of how do we even work with communities, how do we how do we go forward? It, it's, you know, obviously there are ethical board review processes on the um, university and government sides, but where we don't get that as much is the corporate side right especially for for technology development and so things like informed consent informed dissent i love that concept i i can't remember when i was first introduced to that but you know just being able to say no thank you you've informed me of all my rights but i have the right to say no and that's a for whatever reasons in the western world that's a hard thing for people to hear no that there is a research process, that there can be a co-design process. Some of the taboos is definitely looking at um, community helicoptering. What we mean by that is going into a community and popping right out, because really what this is about is relationality. Indigenous values are based on relationships and our relationships, not just to humans, but to non-humans too, such as the land, such as place. And so um, when we're looking at, uh, community helicoptering, the last thing we want are short term relationships. And so that's, this is incredibly important and also at great odds with uh, the corporate world who's often looking at short timelines, you know, profit making and really maximizing efficiencies doesn't necessarily work together, but it needs to work together. And so how do we do that? Um, I'll go to the final slide. The one thing I want to leave you with in terms of just thinking about this is that 
there's often a, a talk about, and you even saw it on, on the title slide about co-design. And co-design is a really interesting um, concept, but I would like to take this a little bit further in terms of talking about empowering communities to design for themselves. So the way that technology is actually used within any given um, tribal community can be incredibly different and should be incredibly different than what it, perhaps the creators were even thinking about. And so I love this, this example of, um, this is actually from the Mescalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico. And this is a high school STEM um, program. Uh, Nate Rayner is an incredible teacher there. He's at the very bottom. And he has, uh, has uh, his you know 15 to 18 year olds working and coding in um, Inde language, right? actually working in um, and encoding in that language, which is something that no other people could do. They're doing that on their own. They've got lots of different types of, of projects going on, but here's the thing, they're doing it themselves. They're doing it for their people and they're doing it with young people, working with older people and then working with people throughout the community. And that's what we call intergenerational learning and intergenerational approaches. I am going to conclude this here and so uh, I thank you for your time. And I think that's that's all for now. Ahia. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was a very thought provoking and important presentation where I think you provided such a unique lens on what community means, belonging, values, and the link with participatory design approaches and empowerment of communities. So I look forward to further reflections um, if we have time. Uh, in our uh, Q&A session and even beyond that. But before we move to our reflection, we will hear from our final speaker, Matt Rogers. Matt has a background in documentary filmmaking, participatory co-design in community development and progressive education. He is continuously curious about the implications and opportunities of technology in society. And he's currently researching the relationship among public trust information systems and governance. Uh, when Matt's not studying, uh, he likes to play the piano, explore new foodie neighborhoods, and watch British comedy. Uh, in a moment, Matt will explore the integration of digital ethics in project-based learning, looking at how digital citizenship is catching on in educational circles. So over the course of the last three years and counting, Matt has developed a bespoke digital citizenship anti-course within an ex uh, experiential project-based curriculum. Matt's presentation, which will feature some forays into public interest technology concepts, will provide a brief overview of what has and importantly hasn't worked in implementing the anti-course. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us and I'll hand over to you for your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Abbas, and thank you all for, well, once again, for joining us at today's colloquium. All right, um, yeah, let's, let's jump in. My name is Matt Rogers, and I am a first year student in the graduate program, the PIT Pitt graduate program. Um, and I work at a traveling high school called Think Global School that is currently located in Oaxaca, Mexico. And today I'll be covering the integration of digital ethics into project-based learning. To start off with, I will go, um, into a short description of uh, my presentation and defining some of the key terms. I'll go into detail about how the integration of digital ethics has changed over time and end with some reflections and next steps. So as Dr. Abbas was just saying, uh, here is my the description of my presentation. Um, I won't necessarily read through it too much, but I do want to highlight some of the keywords um, some of which are digital citizenship, anti-course, experiential, and project-based. Now, when my students start out on a project, one of the first things we teach them to do is to break down the areas of inquiry or the research questions into their component parts. And doing so helps us better understand what it is we're actually setting out to do. And so I'd like to take a few moments here to um, go over some of these highlighted words and um, in an effort to better understand the, the phrases and the terms that are necessary for understanding what I'm going to do over the course of the presentation. We'll start off with digital citizenship. 
The phrase was coined by Mike Ribble and Gerald D. Bailey in their 2007 book, Digital Citizenship in Schools. Since then, definitions of what digital citizenship is have varied, such as participating fully in communities, making smart choices online, being active citizens, uh, leaving a positive and effective digital footprint. But what it all really comes down to is that digital citizenship is about having the knowledge and skills for using the internet safely, ethically, and responsibly. Throughout my presentation today, I will use the phrase digital citizenship to refer to my anti-course, which I'll go over what that means in a moment. The content of the anti-course is within the ballpark of digital ethics. I couldn't quite find a better phrase than digital ethics to explain what the content is, um, and it isn't necessarily representative, though it does uh, relate to it. So what does what do I mean by anti-course? Well, we can't really have an anti-course without a course. If we think back to some of our high school or secondary school days, a lot of us probably took classes in which a state board of education or perhaps a school district decided the content that we were meant to learn. The teacher then translated that content into something aligned with our grade level, our level of understanding. The teacher would designate reading assignments, homework, weekly quizzes, practice tests, actual tests, and perhaps every now and then some more fun activities along the way. And all of the learning was structured in the silo of that subject, such as chemistry, health, English. An anti-course then is largely the opposite. In the context of my digital citizenship work, I decide upon a theme of learning, which I admit is reminiscent, though not quite the same as state boards of education deciding upon class content. Where I differ is that there are no assignments, no homework, no tests. The students lead the activities and learning about digital citizenship transcends other parts of our curriculum. Now, before I go into explaining experiential learning, I must quickly explain our school model. Rather than having traditional subjects, we typically run three interdisciplinary classes, which we call modules every term for four terms each year. I'll be using one of our current modules as an example. Um, it's called V Archaeology. And in that module, students are creating virtual reality experiences that investigate and help preserve various aspects of ancient Zapotec history in Oaxaca. Experiential learning is acutely evident in our modules because in order to gain more than just a rudimentary understanding of their learning topics, students get outside of the classroom to examine, explore, and experience things for themselves. They learn by experiencing, reflecting, thinking, and acting. To continue my V archaeology example, the 10 students in that module visited three archaeological sites in Oaxaca State, which were Yagul, Mitla, and Monte Alban. They have interacted with guest speakers who specialize in Zapotec history, archaeology, and virtual reality. And they have conducted independent research, either online, in consultation with local experts, or by using each other as resources in order to make sense of all the information from their unique perspectives. Finally, we have project-based learning. This is an educational framework which emphasizes, as you may anticipate, learning through projects. Our educators are not necessarily experts me, in the modules that they teach. In fact, the two educators that lead the V-Archaeology module have backgrounds in languages and maps, not history, not VR. Instead, our staff are primarily concerned with teaching students how to create, conduct, manage, and assess their own projects, and in that way, learning how to learn. We focus on skill development, time management strategies, and wellness. And at the end of each project, there must be a product of some kind. The students in the V archaeology module are currently, right now, finalizing their VR experiences in time for our public showcase next week. Iteration one. Um, it all began when, before I was hired, the students had been based in Mumbai, India, taking photos of anything and everything. And I can't necessarily fault them for this. It was their second term. Many of them had never traveled before, and they were very excited to explore a new place and learn new things about it. But what they were said to have missed was perhaps a consideration of appropriateness and a potentially harmful impact. What were perhaps some of the local laws related to a person's right to privacy or their right to their own likeness? 
should the students have gotten consent from the people they were photographing? And might there be ethical implications regarding the attention grabbing use of cell phones and DSLR cameras in say Dharavi, which is one of the largest slums in Asia? I personally have never been to Mumbai. So my ability to gauge the need for students to take some time to think about these things was limited to what I was being told by my colleagues. And so two terms later in Bilbao, Spain, um, which this picture is from, uh, the digital citizenship course began. And to start off with, it was indeed its own course. Every week I had an hour scheduled in our timetable in which all 30 students would join me for a discussion about digital rights and responsibilities, one of Gribble's nine themes of digital citizenship. My main focus was photography. And the first session was a sort of overview. What are digital rights? What are digital responsibilities? Who or what determines them? Who or what influences them? The second session was connected to the Basque Identity module, and it touched upon street photography. The purpose was to get students out of the classroom to practice asking people for permission to take their photos. The third session considered the rights and responsibilities of advertising, especially when it came to the extent of accuracy in food photography. And our final session reflected upon the earlier sessions and about what's real or fake online. Now, to some of the things that I learned from this, uh, this first semester of rights and responsibilities, the roses or the, the, the positive learnings was the session in which I, quote, forced my students to go outside, practice their Spanish, and get over discomfort of perhaps being rejected was their favorite session. Some of them didn't like it at the time, but they realized near the end of the hour that it wasn't so bad talking to strangers, asking for permission to photograph them, and walking away from rejection with grace. I also learned that students enjoyed activity-based learning in particular, whether that was a group discussion, competing in a small advertising competition, or again, taking photos of strangers with their permission. Some of the things that I learned uh, to, to change, or the thorns, was that the term, the term theme and subtopics were quite reactionary. I was relying on perceptions from other staff members, and though that was valuable, information transforms when it passes from person to person. My perception of what other staff were telling me was probably very different than if I had spoken with the students from the start. Also, my approach was disturbingly traditional, which in a, with a, in a progressive school with our own curriculum, standing at the front of a class to teach a lesson wasn't really doing me nor the idea of digital citizenship any favors. Results of a student feedback survey confirmed my concerns about this. Some of the responses sank to the tune of, we already knew this, Matt, why, why do we have to look at this again? I, I could have debated that feedback because actions do speak louder than words, um, but there often is little use in trying to bring teenagers around when they've already made up their minds about what they understand. And that, that was me when I was a teenager as well. <laughs> Now, with all the roses and thorns in mind, I embarked on iteration two. And next up on our travel itinerary was Shanghai, China, followed by Muscat, Oman. I continued using the nine themes of digital citizenship as a guide. But in the interest of time, I'll expand only on China. And I approached the when it came to digital citizenship, the term in China was based around levers of access to internet technologies, for example, um, levers of uh, access with identity, censorship, or education. Each of the following sessions expanded upon one of those levers and tied them into one of the modules, as the table shows. A journey home entailed interviewing migrants from rural areas who came to Shanghai. Therefore, voice recordings, video editing, and digital media management became important for the students to know. Made in China focused on social entrepreneurship, which um, in a country that limits internet access to certain uh, websites and by extension knowledge exchange, this provided an opportunity for students to learn how the internet works and how companies, schools, and governments can step in to censor it. The traditional Chinese medicine module uh, students there worked on chatbots that provided health recommendations based on a person's current wellness. 
Now, while a cool concept, the lever of internet access of identity and the net neutrality uh, content of the digital citizenship, digital citizenship session were a stretch, and I can't quite figure out how to explain they relate to TCM. So what did I learn from this? The roses, uh, one of them was that practical just-in-time sessions were key. The digital media management session really opened the students' eyes to the importance of naming files properly and organizing them, rather than having files all called untitled document. Also, I sporadically gave students options of what content I should cover or what activities they wanted to do. By allowing them more voice and choice in what they learned, they engaged more often and for longer periods of time. On the thorn side, my anticipation of the term themes related to the country we were in largely didn't align with what students wanted or needed. And the TCM module, traditional Chinese medicine, was a great reminder of that. Um, anticipation without responsiveness is just wishful thinking. Secondly, having a separate digital citizenship class on its own wasn't useful. And I found research consistent with this. They say digital citizenship shouldn't be taught in a silo, though some resources are still written as if it is. I'm surprised it took me this long to realize it, that uh, digital citizenship needs to be integrated into other parts of the curriculum. And that takes me to my third iteration. And we also reach our current school year. The first two terms of this year, starting in August, no, in July, um, our school was based in Dubai, UAE. This is partially due to logistical ne necessities with COVID and partially to incorporate the World Expo into our students' projects. My approach this time was all about reflexivity and the willingness to change course at a moment's notice. All 30 students were new to the on-site in-country life following a year of online learning. As such, the theme of Dubai term one was again, digital rights and responsibilities. We had new students, new excitement to travel, freedom from isolation or quarantines in their home countries. But I changed things. I broke the group into three smaller ones, each to ind independently research the concept of digital rights. Number two, that of digital responsibilities. And the third group, researched local laws in Dubai. The groups later presented their findings and helped set a tone for photography ethics. Now back in Spain a few years ago, I had dedicated class time for digital citizenship, not so anymore. Throughout the rest of Dubai term one, I visited each module to spark and moderate discussions on topics related to both rights and responsibilities and the modules themselves, as we see in this table. Um, as one example, we have the future of food module, that we're looking at food systems and journalism. Um, by the end of the term, they were creating a digital magazine full of op-eds and other types of articles. So because that module was creating a digital magazine, it seemed pretty natural to uh, come into their module and go over like, what does copyright mean? What, does, what is intellectual property? And how do we as a school have um, a claim to fair use? that perhaps other institutions would not have. Dubai term two, which we have on this slide, was linked to the World Expo 2020. Once again, building on the success of last term, I integrated digital citizenship into the modules, each of which were based on one of the three themes of Expo 2020, which were mobility, sustainability, and opportunity. The term began with an introductory full group session on data, big, small, or none. The best example here would be this first one. It was looking at mobility using uh, robotics issues, which were picked by the students. At the end of the term, in the small groups, they create groups that performed some sort of action to improve human quality of life in some way. And um, it was really cool to, you know, have to build robots to program them one of the things that I came in to facilitate discussion on. So from those two terms in Dubai, um, the roses that I learned was that by staying nimble and not planning too far ahead, it was easier to stay in the present and dive deep into conversations with the module groups. And this reflexive approach enriches the process of learning. It encourages students to think differently about the projects they're working on. 
and um, which maybe I said this before, or I might have cut out before I said it, but robotics at school can be very cool. But what are the unforeseen circumstances of AI and machine learning in the real world? And yes, it's nice to credit your sources in a journalism piece for class. But why is that a critical skill and understanding both in university and beyond? And the third rose is that integrating a digital citizenship anti-course into other parts of the curriculum is by far the most effective way I've found yet to discuss digital ethics and things in that, um, in that sphere. Coming in just in time to build upon student knowledge and push them into higher order thinking has proven to make their projects more cohesive, understandable, and ambitious. The thorns is that the introductory sessions can be hard to manage with 30 students. Um, some of them, are, of course, may not focus particularly well, but I'm told that setting the, the term tone early is critical as students jump into their module projects. There also seems to be one module each term that doesn't quite fit the theme. Uh, the tax skyscrapers and housing modules are examples of this. Um, I, I've made it work through careful consideration of what might be brought up, and I communicate with module educators regularly to determine at what time a digital citizenship intervention is most useful. So this leads me to the overall uh, reflections. Um, I consistently tell my students that my job is to make things more complex and to make their lives harder. In this way, they make sense in ways that work for them. Their learning becomes more widespread with more breadth. Their projects become more thoughtful and ambitious, and they graduate a bit more sure of their personal codes of ethics. And because these, this integration of digital ethics into our modules has worked so well, it might be time, and these are my next steps, it might be time to involved in other parts of our curriculum, such as our academic writing program, the wellness program, languages, service learning, or post-graduation program. Some of these I have ideas um, for, but others are still in development. Thank you so much for sharing your important message and talk, Matt, in which I really appreciated how you injected so much balance and highlighted the need for iterative processes and also the opportunities and challenges of new educational models. And I believe that this is going to form part of a broader discussion about change in an educational setting uh, in general. Um, thank you so much for your time. I am going to call on Alicia for a reflection of this session in the interest of time. Um, for our speakers, please check the chat window. I believe there might be some questions and some comments in there. And over to you, Alicia. Thank you. Well, I, I would, in the interest of time, I would like to acknowledge that, first of all, Lynn and Matt, thank you for, for your wonderful presentations. And um, I thought I saw a couple of questions in the chat here. I was just saying that I wanted to thank Alicia for the wonderful presentation, having myself worked with the Sioux uh, uh, tribe up in South Dakota for some number of years. My wife is Hikarila Apache from New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Um, and we live there some number of months each year. Uh, but one of the overriding features, I guess, of one's you know, interaction uh, has to be trust, you know, gaining the trust of the people that you're working for. Even though I think, you know, you were spot on with highlighting the various elements, okay, that go into that part of the equation. But I think it all equals trust in the final analysis. And if you are helicoptering in, sometimes it's very difficult uh, to build trust because you're in and then you're out. Uh, so at any rate, thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you for that. And yeah, you know, what's what's interesting about the trust factor is that, you know, I, I alluded to very briefly um, the histories of why there is not trust there. Um, but, you know, going even beyond Indigenous um, communities, uh, trust is not is obviously critical for Indigenous communities, but it's also critical for, for all uh, communities, particularly those who have marginalized, oppressed histories. And so, you know, as a mixed race person, that's also something that I'm, I'm always kind of looking at both in terms of, okay, so, you know, if we have these critical ways of working, there are even, especially in Canada, there are very defined ways uh, to work legally with um, tribal communities. We have that somewhat within the United States. But, you know, I, I, I kind of push on that a little bit in terms of saying, yes, Absolutely. And, you know, why do we not have 
ethical standards and ethical frameworks for working with predominantly African American communities, you know, Latinx communities, Asian communities, etc. Um, and and so trust is huge, and that's something that doesn't always go together with our capitalist mindset. And so where does that come together, you know, in 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 terms of taking some time and and how do how do we get out of performative within you know the, the corporation realm but also the academic realm Ac academics can be just as performative as well and um and and truly work to build that the the trust and to get to know these communities as well yeah just just to not not to belabor it but i worked as a special public defender for many years um, where my clients were you know often black young people uh, and the justice system itself, okay, really didn't foster that kind of thinking. So it was awfully difficult, okay, to get them to trust anybody, mm -hmm. given what the institution itself, okay, is frankly standing for. So that's just probably a whole separate conversation. I think Matt, some um, another uh, another. Uh, aside from the fact that everybody wants to nominate you for the Global Teacher of the Year Award, <laughs> which would be great. Um, I think there was a question from Jason. I don't Mike, could you just tell us how the students will present their VR experience? So to the audience, how would they do that? Absolutely. Yeah, the uh, our showcase um, presentations, our public presentations often vary from term to term. Um, this time it will be very much a, a gallery walk style. Um, and we have three um, Oculus Quests VR headsets that uh, the students have been using, and um, we'll have that available for for yeah audience members to put on, and the students will kind of walk them through their journey of learning, as well as uh, the experience that's happening in the headsets. So the audience will be able to put on the headsets, or will it be some printed out photos and some videos running? What sort yeah, of combination would you have? Right, the audience will be able to put on the headsets. Well, Robert, can I just say three magnificent presentations? You know, you can't get a better 90 minutes, I don't think. It's the social impact mindset, you know, there are no limits. And then we get into all of the things Alicia talked about, which is really stuff that is like a masterclass for me in taking my students into Indigenous communities. And then, Matt, if there is no award, I'll send one over to you. You're an exemplar of, you know, what I would like my daughter's teachers to be. So well done to everybody. Thanks. What a lovely way to wrap things up, um, Jason. I couldn't have said that better myself. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, to Lynn Nethkin, uh, to Alicia Demesa, to Matt Rogers, and to my wonderful co-host, Katina Michael, our logistics and support team, Natasha Radleff, Melissa Waite, and Anna Reed, and to all of you for attending today's session and for joining us. Uh, a quick reminder before we wrap up that the recording of this session will be available on the School for the Future of Innovation in Society's YouTube channel, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much, Alicia for your brilliant moderation of this session and have a great rest of day everyone thank you so much thank you everyone congratulations thank you all thank you everyone